Hello and welcome to this episode of T-Tech. So today we're going to be covering how to get started with GNU slash Linux. So essentially, just like many other operating systems, we have a few basic first steps. So the first and most important step is to find a suitable computer. So this can be a desktop, a laptop, a smartphone, or an embedded system like a Wi-Fi router, or, you know, or any single board computer. So there's a lot of compatibility with Linux. So after you've done that, so you want to then find an installer image. And these come in many different uh, shapes and, and forms and things. But it'll normally be an ISO file or an IMG file. And after that, you want to use the image and make the install media, of course. You can do that with things like Etcher or um, uh, Rufus if you're on Windows. There's many other things. You can even just use the dd command if you're already on Linux. So, in addition, install it. And then, optionally at least, you can choose to install a different um, graphical user environment. So this means things like Xorg and your desktop environment, like maybe KDE or GNOME 3 or something like that. Or, you know, even a smaller window manager like Fluxbox or Rat Poison. Um, you can install those on Linux as well. And even you can customize your login manager too. So there's many things you can do, but I will say even on a server with Linux, you actually might not want to install a graphical user environment because you don't want the overhead of that. You know, a server is a different set of tasks than what a desktop needs to be. So that is our main first steps with Linux. Now, our pros and cons of Linux. This was an interesting list to make, and it's just my personal opinion. So a pro, let's start with the pros. First of all is we have excellent cross-platform support. So what I mean by this is you can run Linux on something as small as like a Raspberry Pi, um, the, the small little nano ones that are low power ARM based processors. Um, you can run them on smartphones, ARM processors, but you can run them on something as powerful as a clustered um, x86-64 machine. So you could run huge distributed workloads like what the, you know, the big, um, you know, the big websites, just name your website, um, things that they use, you know, and anything in between. So there's, there's many different CPU architectures that can understand and run the Linux code. In addition to that, though, that code does have a very small footprint. So you can get Linux distributions that can be, in some cases, as small as 5 megabytes. All right. So I know it's a little bit bigger than your average you know, floppy back in the day, but um, you can get something that small. You can get them you know, as big as over 4 gigabytes in size. It just depends what your use is and how you're using it. These systems with Linux are always reliable. Um, you will have corner cases where you'll see crashes um, from like systems being overloaded and things of that nature. But for the for the vast majority of uh, things you're going to be throwing at it, it's very reliable. Um, this laptop is running Linux Mint that I'm recording this on, and it's been up for a month. And yes, I still update it, but it's been up for a month and I've had no problems, and I'm using it as a desktop. Now, this other one here is the GNU userland and Linux kernel are developed separately. Now, to be honest, depending on your uh, depending on what you think about this, it can be a pro or it can be a con. So, what this means is the kernel, which is the brains of the system, and that takes all of a computer's hardware resources, all right, all the physical things in it, like the CPU, the RAM, the hard disk, things like that, and it bridges it so software can make system calls into that kernel in whatever programming language and talk to all those devices and use the resources. Now, with it being separated, what sometimes happens 
is there can be mismatches in the code for, say the kernel gets ahead by one version and you're using a program to manage your files or something that is a little bit older. And let's, hypothetically anyway, say that you have a read call for opening a file on your hard disk. But maybe that call changed a little bit in this version of Linux for that kernel's uh, system call. Well, because they're developed separately, you have the scenario where your user land tools, the programs you're using, can get out of date with what the kernel calls are. Now, in practice, there's backward compatibility layers and things, and they never change things that radically where it would break things like that. But it can happen, say, over the span of like five years, three years, something like that. And you can get problems like that. But it, uh, it, it can be a pro or a con, however you slice it. Now, ease of use, um, it is very easy to use. It's not like the early to late 90s um, where it was a very difficult thing to use Linux. Um, it's improved a lot since then. And um, not the last pro I have here is there is a version of GNU slash Linux for almost every use case you can think of. You can use customized what are called distributions, distros for short, and you can have something like a network firewall distribution, customized only to be a firewall, so you could throw that on an old computer you have, and it's going to protect all your computers and connect them out to the internet. You can go all the way over to having something like, um, for video editing, there is distros dedicated for audio uh, post-production, video post-production, many things like that. And there's also distros for forensics, uh, for computer forensics and things. And of course, desktops as well. So there, there's so many, I cannot name them all. I've used so many over the years for different things I've done. So with the choice of all those distros though, my first con I can think of is there's too many choices. Um, th there's so many distros that do the same thing. It can be very overwhelming to choose the right one. My tip to you to cut through all the fog of that, use what works for you. And forget about the rest, forget about opinions of other people. Um, use what works for you, even if it's not the most popular choice of distro. If it works for your use case, um, use it to your heart's content. So with all of those distros, there is inconsistency between them. Um, things like configuration file locations. Like, for instance, if you have a Debian distro where your configuration for your network cards are mostly in Etsy slash network, and then your interface is file, um, you could move over to a Red Hat based distribution where you're going to have that in Etsy config in different locations. So, the, what you're configuring between distros is the same concept, but where the files are stored to control it and the syntax in those files can be completely different. So just because you learn one distro how to do something does not mean that knowledge is going to transfer exactly over to another distro. So it's a little bit different in that respect. Now because of that, um, in my opinion, commands overlap for similar tasks. So in Debian, you have app-get update. Um, but in your uh, Red Hat distros, you have things like yum space update. So there's different commands that do the same thing at the end of the day, but they all have different syntax. <clears throat> now the code between them changes very rapidly. Um, something you learned, you know, five seconds ago will be different, you know, right away. So one thing you learn, you, you are going to have to update your knowledge. Um, but the, I will say, the major commands and um, different things I've learned with Linux over the years have the fundamentals of it have stayed the same for a long time. So some code bases don't change with these tools, but it all depends on the distro. So with all of these distros, they come and go quickly. I remember I used to run Crunch Bang Linux. And uh, CrunchBang Linux was awesome, and it introduced me to a, to a tool called Conky, that is C-O-N-K-Y. 
Um, but now that distro sadly does not exist anymore. Um, but these these are all things I've I've used over the time I've been doing this. Now, with all of those distros, they also vary in code. So the size of their code base, the coding style the developers use, even the programming languages can vary. Um, the activity of the groups can vary in different projects, how the um, different members are in different um, roles in that project. Some distros have entire companies backing them, like Ubuntu, for instance. So there's many um, different management styles and, and different distros. And coming back to the overlapping of commands a little bit, I do believe that sometimes distros can reinvent the wheel a little bit. So, you know, something worked good in one distro for configuring it, but just because we can, we're going to add five more command layers on top of that. Um, and a lot of it comes back to scalability um, for like data centers and things like Ubuntu has many tools that help scale configurations like NetPlan. You can code it all in a, in a um, YAML file and then have that scale out across multiple servers. But there is uh, many things you'll notice if you try different distributions that it's like, hmm, I think I've seen this before, but it's a little bit different. So you you got to keep that in mind. But anyway, that's our pros and cons. So now the fun part. Use cases. Firewalls and routers, of course, just like many other operating systems. You can use IDS and IPS systems. So you can install things like Snort and Sericata on a Linux system. So that's intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems. Um, servers, any kind of server, a web server, email server, DNS, um, and many others. Wireless access points. Um, believe it or not, a lot of your Wi-Fi routers, even the one you're probably using right now, uses some form of embedded of an embedded Linux system to be able to function and run that router's hardware. So it's really cool with that. Um, a switch or a bridge, you can set it up so you have a layer 2 Ethernet switch with Linux. And other bridging, like with uh, virtual machines, I use a lot. You can use bridges with those. Um, desktops and laptops, we're going to talk about that today. And single board computers, like Raspberry Pis and Rock 64 machines, things like that. Oh, also, Pine phones. That's another interesting use of a single board computer um, with Linux. So here are some resources before we go out and do um, a little walk around these. The Free Software Foundation. Um, this is the foundation that champions free software, essentially. They advocate for it. And um, a little side note, there is a difference between the term open source and free software. And you can go on fsf.org to learn about that. I won't go over it here. But uh, essentially, there, there's a few differences, and they clearly state them on their website. It is uh, very important if that those uh, issues are important to you, go there. Um, the GNU website, and GNU is uh, an acronym that stands for GNU is not Unix. Because remember, Linux <coughs> is not the traditional Unix from 1969 at Bell Labs. So, you know, from the 70s time frame. Linux is actually a rewrite by a gentleman named Linus Torvalds. He wrote his own kernel while studying at university. And that kernel um, came into um, came, came into being in 1991. And then tools that were written at MIT by Richard Stallman and many other gentlemen um, they were rewriting all of Unix's programs in a free way. So a freely redistributable way that everyone can use and benefit from. So they didn't have the kernel yet. And you can read um, read about this and look up documentaries. They're very interesting. But they didn't have the kernel yet. And because of that, um, Torvald's kernel got put with the GNU um, user land and made the first Linux distro. So that is a little bit of a history lesson there on that. 
Um, there's a lot I have left out, so go ahead and look that up for yourself. It's, it's very important uh, knowledge to have, to know where, where all this came from. So GNU and the Free Software Foundation have a list of recommended distros that are freely redistributable and only use open source software. There is nothing proprietary about them. Um, there's no line of code in those systems that you cannot read for yourself. That's the core of it. And the fact of the matter as well is that you're not controlled by one entity. The community can work on the software together. So even if you can't program, you can make changes with the help of a programmer that might help you. All right, so that's what the, the free part of it. And if you want to know so much more than I could tell you, look up Richard Stallman, uh, free software. Look at his TED Talks and things like that. <clears throat> but you have here Linux.org from there as well. That's just for general information about Linux and tutorials. Everything from system administration to installation. Um, a good Linux distro to get started with is Debian, and that's the website for the Debian Linux distro. And Linux Mint, this is the one I am using right now. It's an Ubuntu based Linux distribution. And as you will see, Ubuntu itself is actually based on Debian. So it's a very interesting hierarchy of, uh, of distros there, and that's why. I think there's so much confusion and overlap between them, but they're still all very good in their own way. Slackware, that's the original Linux distro, one of the very first ones, right up there with Debian. Now as well, Gentoo, this is a source code based Linux distro, and uh, you install things from source code there using the emerge command, so there's, there's different commands in all of the distros. They all have good documentation as well about them. There's Linux from scratch, which I absolutely love Linux from scratch. It will take up at least one weekend, maybe two of your time, if you dedicate a lot of time to it. But you can build your own Linux system entirely from source code. So you can install something like Debian Linux on a computer you have, and then you can use a partition on that computer, or a virtual machine even, to partition and format um, your a new file system for Linux, and you can start to down you change it into that system, and then start to download and build the kernel, the user land utilities, all by hand. So there's nothing that there is not no um, what's called package management. It's all from source code, and I've completed that probably about four or five times over my lifetime. So I've, I've done it quite a bit, but it is amazing, and um, you always learn something new every time. So um, speaking of embedded devices, you have Libra CMC, which is a fully free software-based Linux distro for your Wi-Fi routers and other things like that. OpenWRT, which is the same thing for Wi-Fi routers and other small computers. Um, DD-WRT as well, that's the same idea. Um, both OpenWRT and DDWRT can also run on full-fledged x86 hardware. So you can have a lot of fun there, too, if you want to. Um, the last one here is Blast2, our kernel.org, which is a mirror for your Linux kernel source code. And they host many other projects there as well. But you can also find the source code for the Linux kernel on GitHub as well. Um, as well, the last one here is DistroWatch. It's a good place to check for current and evolving Linux distro news. It's a great website. You can see rankings of them. You can see when distros you've never even heard of have had a new release and things like that. So with that, that's a basic introduction to Linux. The main resources to help you get started and some things about it. But what we'll do now is we'll go on distrowatch.org and visit a few of the other distro sites I mentioned and give you a little bit of a look around them. So I will see you in a second. All right, so the first stop on our tour is Ubuntu.com. So this is actually my first uh, Linux distro I ever tried. Um, for here, you have community uh, forums and things, tutorials and documentation, and this, uh, you know, updates all the time. 
Uh, but essentially what you would do is if you want a desktop system, you'd go under here and find wherever it says in the future Ubuntu Desktop. And you have the year followed by the month that it comes out. So we can go ahead and click uh, there. And um, for this one, you actually want to go here and now they've changed it already. And you can just download their ISO file and put that on uh, USB for yourself. Uh, but that's how you get started with that one. Then you go through their installation process. So now we're going to move on to Debian.org. All right, now on Debian.org here, um, this is actually the operating system that um, that Ubuntu is based off of. So they actually take Debian and make changes to it, and then they have their own distro. So here um, we have a few things like user support, security advisories for keeping your system up to date. And that isn't just important on a network firewall or a server. It is also very important on a desktop system to keep your information secure and things like that and more project news and things um, but you just want to go click wherever they move download and you can download this net installer um, you do need an active internet connection not just for the download but also to install it um, because after you in start the installation it pulls down software that you select during the installation so you can uh, do it that way as well um, Another thing you can do is if, let's see here, I believe under getting Debian is where it is now, but you, um, you can get a complete installation image that has everything on it um, built into the installer image, and you don't have to have an internet connection to use that except to download it. Um, you can you choose a smaller image, so we can click here, and what you want to do is go to the tiny CDs and flexible USB sticks heading. Um, and these are your different CPU architectures, i386, ARM HF, ARM64, AMD64, and other architectures like MIPS. What you can do is select this, and then you can go to Netboot. And then from here, you want to download the mini.iso. And that is a very small ISO that you can then customize to be um, custom systems like a server or a network firewall. Um, that's what I use that for. Um, another reason to use that is if you want a different desktop environment besides just the GNOME default. Um, you can then install your own right from the get-go and save disk space um, um, by using that. But most distros come pre-installed with a full desktop environment for you. So you don't have to worry about any of that. They usually come with a desktop environment and their own management tools for updates and all things like that. So the next stop on our list, let's see, well, we'll go to Gentoo next. All right, so Gen with Gentoo Linux, um, you may want to start with the Get Started tab, of course, but essentially you boot a live environment and then you install it um, from that live environment. Now, this is not as easy and straightforward to do as something like Debian or Ubuntu. So I think this, in my opinion, is more of an intermediate distribution where something like Linux from scratch would be an advanced uh, distribution. So that's kind of how you want to gauge these. Uh, but that's how you get started with that. And then after you boot, you download these tarballs called Stage uh, 3 and they used to have like a, a stage two and things like that. But you will want to download these and then like this hardened one. This would be like for a server. The tools in there are compiled specifically for um, to have vulnerabilities that if you compile it a certain way, it might have a vulnerability. But if you compile it this way, it uh, turns off that vulnerable code. Things like that. And that's what um, these are um, geared toward is people that are very um, very aware of how to compile software in the most secure way and you can turn on and off features you may not need for something like a firewall and things like that. Okay so now with uh, Linux from scratch you can see there's different uh, variations of it. You have the traditional Linux from scratch, you have the beyond Linux from scratch, and the automated Linux from scratch as well. 
but what you want to do is start with Linux from scratch if you're interested and what you do to start this is you want to go to the read online tab and then you want to go into the stable book but uh, from here you go down to their stable here and then you go through this book this is version 11 I've done all the way back to like I think it was version 7 or 8 over the years and I've done um, versions uh, after that as well but essentially this book I mean this is not something that's gonna work out of the box because you have to use another Linux distribution to build it on an existing system or on a virtual machine so this is a very cool guide and um, you, you will spend lots of time scouring over the the commands and and things like that you'll get very familiar with the flow of configure make make install and if you choose to do this you'll understand what those three commands do and uh, learn a lot from that about building source code but yeah that is uh, a little bit about Linux from scratch and uh, when you get um, done with the base of that you can then go to beyond Linux from scratch and let's see if they still have this I think they do let's see yes and what this is is uh, most systems like for instance most distros already have Linux tables and I'm uh, IP tables I'm sorry installed but this does because you're compiling each user land tool you want to use um, by hand so what you do is you know install it you configure it and then make install it on your system but you have to do that for everything and then you have to keep everything updated later by hand uh, but that's what you do after you get the base installed and you can install so many different things but that's a little bit about Linux from scratch there's many more things about that Linux Mint so this is what I'm actually using right now um, you can go to download and download their newest version here and they have good installation instructions um, you have different desktop environments and again though um, think back to Debian when I showed you the mini.iso file Th that is where you can customize it and only install what you the desktop environment you want to use with these and um, you know with other distros it's already pre-installed for you so you don't have a choice um, but th this is the one I use the mate edition um, that's the version I use but you can use XFCE and other editions but the uh, BSDs as well they use these as well so a lot of software is in both operating systems but uh, that's a little bit about Linux Mint you just download the image and install it alright so on distro watch this is essentially they keep track of all the new Linux distribution news as well as BSDs and other random operating systems out there so um, Kali Linux you can learn about it there you can um, let's just do it real quick you can go to the page here and um, this uh, this page here tells you it's Debian based actually so they use Debian as their base and they tweak it and add forensic tools and everything to uh, give you a pen testing distribution and other things like that for every distro on this site they have a listing here and you can see all of the information about the distribution but uh, that's one of them you can also see the popularity of the distros here on the right hand side and in no particular order they're they're listed just by the activity on the websites if you scroll down you can even see like FreeBSD which isn't Linux but um, they're on there as well and you can learn a lot just by browsing this list of distributions um, let's see what else do I want to show you here uh, the search page is very helpful because if you want let us see where was it right here OS type and distribution category you can see we can look for beginner distros we can look for forensic distros we can look for firewall distros um, and different things like that so 
with that search box, you can see different categories of distros and many other um, many other um, things about that distro. All right, so this is openwrt.org. Now, this is uh, for embedded systems for the most part. And if you go to uh, their, well, quick start guide is a good way to, to get started with it. Essentially, you need to find out if your device is compatible and things like that. You can go through this guide to learn all of that stuff. But we can also go to supported devices. And in supported devices, we can see, let's see, do they have a table? So this table shows you um, any type of Wi-Fi router you might have in whatever brand. It shows you the version of uh, OpenWRT that it supports and other things like that. And there's too many to name here, but um, that's your list there. DDWRT is very similar, uh, but like if you click 1407 here for supported release, that will bring you over to this page where you can then download the Linux image from here. Like if you had an Atheros device or anything like that, like we would click this and you want to download the bin file or the combined, it just depends on your needs. Again, um, with those devices, the only output you have is serial most times. And a lot of the time, like back in the day, I used to solder on serial uh, pin headers and uh, unbrick these devices and um, uh, be, be able to see, um, configure them and see things about them. You uh, can do that. But if you mess up the installation, the device won't boot anymore. So don't do this on your main Wi-Fi router. Uh, maybe buy a used one and get experience first before you go and change your firmware on your router. But that's a little bit about how you do that from there. All right, now at DDWRT, uh, we can see here about it. The quickest way is go to the router database. Um, let's say I have an R6400 from Netgear. I'm going to type that in, and then I'm going to find what version I have here. And then I'll go ahead and click in, and you can. This is to go from factory, so the factory Netgear firmware to DDWRT, just upload it to it. And this is after DDWRT is installed, you can then just flash any version of DDWRT that supports the device. But with Netgear, it, if you go to try this with this distro, it's a little different. The, it has to be signed correctly, the firmware header. So you have to do the factory one. Um, Linux, um, Linux, Linksys devices um, don't have that restriction. So like some devices like the good old fashioned WRT150, you can just download the one for that. And uh, let's see, they have many versions uh, with the 2.4 version of Linux, but um, you can download that and upload that to the device as well. If you, if you still have that uh, model, you can find them used to practice on if you want, though, all over things like eBay and Amazon, sites like that. Um, but that is DDWRT and OpenWRT and these different things. Um, remember, OpenWRT and DDWRT are not things you would use on a desktop system. You can with DDWRT and the other, but um, mostly these are embedded uh, based systems. So this is Libra CMC, and it is the uh, free software version of an embedded system. But what you would do is go to supported hardware. And again, you have to remember the software can only support hardware that uh, freely releases the documentation of, about how it works. So this list is very limited because a lot of these devices use proprietary pieces. Uh, therefore, the software that runs like a Wi-Fi card is actually proprietary and cannot be put in a system that calls itself free software. But that's a little bit like here, the WNDR3800. This is where you would download the factory file like before and flash it to the web interface and then you can upgrade with this file or download the core file, which is has no web server in it. It's just the CLI or the shell. All right, so this is Triscoll on triscoll.org.
info. So this is a fully freely redistributable and um, open source Linux distribution that is, let's see, I believe Ubuntu based, I believe. Let's go to their documentation. Yes, it is a uh, distribution of the GNU Linux operating system. So you can learn all about it down here, the development, the philosophy. It is based on Ubuntu and it is Ubuntu based, but the difference is they have taken out every proprietary piece. So I have tried Triscoll before. And to my um, shock and displeasure, something called VirtualBox, the Oracle version at least, is uh, closed source in some respects. So if you want to find out exactly the software on Linux um, that, you, that you may be using, proprietary based software, install this and find out all the things you cannot install. Then you'll have a very good idea about um, how this distro um, really focuses on that free software um, mythology and things like that. But again, you just download this, uh, Triscoll 9 at the time of the recording, and they have a long-term support edition when it was released. And you can go ahead and download, let's see here, 32-bit for x86-32 or x86-64, select a mirror, you can download a torrent file for uh, better peer-to-peer -peer, uh, speeds and things like that, and to redistribute the file, or just download the ISO. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you is tools you can use to write the installation file for any of these systems onto a USB stick. Um, the only one that that's not true for is the embedded systems like Libra CMC or DDWRT. Those do not get written there. They get uploaded directly to the device. All right, so this is uh, some tools I use for this. It's very straightforward with uh, Etcher here. You select your image. This would be your ISO image. You select your drive. That's your USB stick. And then you flash. It's very simple uh, with Etcher. Another one that's helpful is Rufus. And uh, you can go ahead and create these files, if you're watching this on Windows, you can download the EXE of Rufus and take like a Debian ISO or an Ubuntu ISO and load it into Rufus and then put it on your USB stick from there. And that's two ways to do it. Another way you can do it is if you're already on Linux, you can use the DD command with an input file parameter, like let's say your Ubuntu whatever the version is in the future, and ISO, and then whatever your USB stick gets named, it's going to have a device node put in uh, the kernel, and it could be something like dev sdb, and you want to write that to it. You can use a block size of like 1M uh, here, and I use status equals progress to be able to see its progress. Um, but you can also use variations like 12, 512K uh, and things like that. You don't need that though. Um, that is sufficient to be able to do that. And while I'm on the topic, if you want to back up an install image you already created off a of USB, put the USB as the input file and as the output file, put whatever Ubuntu version dot IMG. All right, so that'll be your image. And then what you could do is convert that to maybe a VDI file to boot up in a virtual machine or back to an ISO or even just tar it up or something for storage. That's uh, things you can do with that. One thing is if you use this method, do not put your hard drive in accidentally because then you won't be able to boot your system um, and things like that. But that's a quick rundown of all of the different methods you can use for this. So uh, with that, though, that is a introduction of getting started to Linux. So I do hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you found it useful. I do appreciate you for viewing. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day, and enjoy using Linux. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. It's been Tyler with Z Tech.